So to understand diabetes mellitus, we must first understand the physiology of blood glucose regulation. Now, sometimes in this talk, I might slip up and say sugar instead of glucose, because in clinical practice, very often we talk about blood sugar levels. It's a bit sloppy, really. We should really talk about blood glucose levels. Glucose is the monosaccharide sugar which is present in the blood. And it's the only type of sugar found in the blood. So when we talk about blood sugar, blood glucose is what we really mean. Now, I know that other types of sugar are absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract. Galactose and fructose, for example, are also monosaccharides that are absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract. But they don't circulate in the systemic blood usually because the first time those sugars go through the liver, the liver will convert them to glucose. So glucose is the sugar in the blood. And it's used by many, many cells, virtually all the cells in the body are using glucose as their fuel supply. They use it for energy. So glucose needs to be present in the blood at all times to fuel all the physiological processes going on. Well, it doesn't fuel all of the physiological process because other metabolic substrates are sometimes used, such as fats. But we always need some glucose in the blood. And we want just the right amount. If there's too much, that's called hyperglycemia. Hyper always means high. So we don't want hyperglycemia. That would be too much. The blood would be too sweet, too sugary. But there again, we don't want hypoglycemia. We don't want it to go too low. So we need it to be homeostatically regulated. Not low hypoglycemia, not high hyperglycemia. Both of these states are abnormal. That's why we have these clinical words for them. They're abnormal situations. We want just the right amount of glucose in the blood. It needs to be homeostatically controlled. Now, if we don't give you anything to eat for about 12 hours and you're healthy, we'll find that your blood sugar is going to be around about 3.6 to 5.8 millimoles of glucose per litre. So that will be a normal fasting blood level. 3.6 to 5.8 millimoles. Now, if you've had something to eat, it can go a bit higher, but that would be the normal fasting range. And how is it maintained? For example, if you eat a lot, lots of sugar is going to go into your blood and it's going to start to rise. How do we stop it rising too far and becoming hyperglycemic? That's what this physiology is about. And you might have realised the place to start this story is the pancreas. The pancreas is a glandular organ. It's in the upper abdominal cavity at the back and the head is towards the right side and the tail is towards the left side. So let's draw a pancreas and try and start the story from there. Now, the pancreas is an endocrine gland and an exocrine gland. And you might remember that an exocrine gland is a gland which excretes its product from the gland in ducts. It has ducts. So the pancreas has ducts. So here we have the main pancreatic duct. And there's going to be branches off it into the tissue of the gland. So there we have the ductal system in the pancreas. And it's an organ with a head, a body and a tail. So the head of the pancreas is up here, and the tail is down here. Now, about 90% of the pancreas is exocrine. It's made of cells called acina cells, the exocrine glandular tissue in the pancreas. And what this does is it produces digestive enzymes. So these digestive enzymes are going to be produced in these acina cells, that is the exocrine tissue of the pancreas, go down these ducts. When it gets to the main pancreatic duct, it's going to go down. And you might remember from your anatomy that that is going to go into the duodenum. So the digestive enzymes going into the duodenum are nearly all produced in the exocrine tissue of the pancreas 
which is fine, but it's not what we're interested in today. Throughout the pancreas, there's about a million little dots called islets. So without the pancreas, we'll draw them a bit big. They're not really this big. So there's about a million of these pancreatic islet cells. And like me, you might have learnt the old-fashioned name, the islets of Langerhan. That's Langerhan, I guess, was well, it was the guy who discovered them. These days, we tend just to call them the pancreatic islets. So throughout the pancreas, there's about a million little dots of these pancreatic islets. And these are not exocrine, like the acina cells, they are endocrine. So about 10% of the mass of the pancreas is these pancreatic islets, the endocrine tissue of the pancreas. And if we look at one of these under larger magnification, here we have a pancreatic islet of Langerhan. That's one of the islets. What we see is there's two main sorts of cells. Round about the outside, mostly round the outside, there's a type of cell called an alpha cell. And that's the Greek letter alpha. So these are the alpha cells. Mostly round the outside. the alpha cells. But then towards the centre of the islet, the other sort of cell, mostly towards the centre of the islet, these are the beta cells. And this is the Greek letter beta. And these are the main cells that detect the levels of sugar in the blood. So, if blood sugar rises, if there's an increase in blood sugar levels, that increase in blood sugar levels is actually detected by the beta cells. They detect increases in blood sugar levels. And when there's an increase in blood sugar level, they respond by producing the hormone insulin. So insulin is produced by the beta cells in response to hyperglycemic stimuli. When the blood sugar goes up, the beta cells produce insulin. The only cells in the body that produce insulin are these beta cells in the pancreatic islets. And they are endocrine because the hormone produced, and insulin is a hormone, goes straight into the blood for systemic distribution. But if the blood sugar levels drop, if the blood sugar levels are reduced, that reduction in blood sugar level, that hypoglycemia, is detected by the alpha cells. The alpha cells are sensitive to low levels of sugar in the blood. They, uh, I said sugar, didn't I? I meant glucose. Low levels of glucose in the blood. And when they detect low levels of glucose in the blood, they respond by producing another endocrine hormone called glucagon. So the beta cells produce insulin when blood sugar levels rise. The alpha cells produce and release glucagon when blood sugar levels fall. And let's think about what these things do first of all. Now, if blood sugar level rises, if there's an increase in blood sugar levels, what you've got is lots of individual glucose molecules in the blood. So there's going to be lots of individual glucose molecules. And they're kind of shaped like this. They've got a carbon on six corners. You might remember glucose is uh, C6H12O6. Lots of individual soluble glucose molecules. This is what's putting the blood sugar level up. And the first thing that insulin does is insulin will convert this glucose, convert this glucose, and what it will do is it will string a whole load of these individual glucose molecules together to make a big strand of them. So instead of being individual molecules, they'll all be stuck together.
maybe hundreds of them all in, all in a unit. And this is called this is called glycogen. So insulin will act as an enzyme catalyzing. Insulin will convert these individual glucose molecules together into a big long one, a polysaccharide called glycogen. And that glycogen will be stored in the muscles and in the liver. It will be stored. So I think you can see now that instead of having untold billions of these glucose molecules floating around all over the place causing hyperglycemia, now they're all strung together neatly packaged into big long polysaccharide glycogen molecules. This is actually a starchy molecule, it's sometimes called animal starch actually in biology. And now they're all parked away in the liver and in the muscles. So the glucose is no longer in the blood, it's stored in the liver and muscles as glycogen, therefore the amount of sugar in the blood has gone down. In other words, Insulin has had a hypoglycemic effect. It has lowered blood sugar levels down back to a more homeostatic range. But there's something else that glucose does as well. Now let's think about the cells in the body. So here we have a body cell. Now, what is it that actually needs the glucose? What actually uses the glucose in the cells? Well, you might remember it's the organelles called the mitochondria. So inside the cell, there might be several hundred of these mitochondria, not drawn to scale, obviously. And in the mitochondria, what happens is that the glucose is combined with oxygen, so we get glucose plus oxygen, and that gives us energy. And it also gives us water, and it also gives us carbon dioxide. So in the mitochondria, the glucose is metabolized in the presence of oxygen to give us energy, and it also gives water and carbon dioxide. So here we have the glucose molecule in the tissue fluid, in the blood or tissue fluid, and it wants to get to the mitochondria. But there's actually a problem here, because glucose is a water-soluble molecule. It dissolves in water. But the cell membrane, round about the outside of the cell, do you remember what cell membranes are made of? They're actually phospholipid layers. It's a phospholipid bilayer, actually. So the cell membrane contains a lot of fat, a lot of lipid. But because the glucose molecule is water-soluble, it won't diffuse into the fatty cell membrane. So water-soluble molecules will not diffuse into fatty cell membranes. Therefore, for most of the cells in the body, such as fat cells, or muscle cells, or liver cells, we've got a problem here. Here's the mitochondria inside that wants the glucose, but the glucose can't get through the phospholipid bilayer of the cell membrane. It can't get through. It won't diffuse through. So what has to happen here? We have to have some way of getting it through. Well, what we have on the surface of the cells. On the surface of the cells there's something called an insulin receptor. So here we have an insulin receptor. And the insulin receptor is what you call a transmembrane protein. It goes through the membrane. So there's part of the insulin receptor on the outside in the tissue fluids and there's part of the insulin receptor inside in the cytosol of the cell. Now, let's go back a bit to here. We know that the blood sugar level has started to go up, so the beta cells are producing the endocrine hormone insulin. And this is a string of amino acids 
It's a short protein and it's got a particular shape. Today, let's assume that it's round. So because the blood sugar level has gone up, the beta cells have released insulin. And this insulin is circulating all around the body. And eventually, this insulin will get to one of the insulin receptors on the surface of the cell and it will stick onto that insulin receptor. And the combination of the insulin and the insulin receptor triggers off changes inside the cell. And the changes inside the cell are called the secondary messenger system. So if you were thinking about messenger systems, the insulin itself would be the primary messenger system. The insulin molecule combines with the insulin receptor, which is a transmembrane cell protein. And that triggers off secondary changes inside the cytosol of the cell. And what you've actually got knocking around inside the cell is you've got donut-shaped molecules. Donut-shaped molecules. And these are just sitting inside the cell, not doing anything. They're actually called GLUT. GLU stands for glucose, and the T stands for transporter. These are glucose transporter molecules. And they are like polo mints or donuts. They've got a hole through the middle. And what happens is that this donut shaped molecule, when it's stimulated by the secondary messenger system, rises to the surface of the cell. And it sits on the surface of the cell. And the membrane does not extend to the inside part of the glucose transporter molecule. So, the insulin comes along, binds to the insulin receptor. The combination of the insulin molecule and the insulin receptor triggers off secondary changes inside the cell. Those secondary changes stimulate GLUT molecules, glucose transporter molecules, which are just loitering around inside the cell. It stimulates them to come to the surface of the cell. And once these glucose transporter molecules are on the surface of the cell, the glucose can go through the middle and into the cell. Once it's in the cell, the glucose can go to the mitochondria, which are just sitting there waiting for the glucose, and will use the, mitochond the mitochondria will use the glucose in the presence of oxygen to produce energy to fuel physiological life-giving processes, producing water and carbon dioxide as well. So hopefully you can see now that because of the insulin, the glucose transporter molecules are now in place. That means the glucose has gone from the blood and tissue fluids in the extracellular environment through into the cytosol inside the cell. They're now in the intracellular environment and are being used by the mitochondria, which was the whole purpose of the exercise anyway. So insulin is lowering blood glucose by two mechanisms. Firstly, it's converting soluble glucose into insoluble glycogen for storage. And secondly, the insulin is combining with the insulin receptor molecules, triggering secondary changes, causing the glucose transporter molecules to rise to the surface of the cell, to gate, that's the right term, it gates the glucose into the cell. And I think you can see that the more glucose molecules that are gated into the cell, the less glucose molecules are going to be left in the blood and tissue fluid. Therefore, the lower blood glucose levels are going to be. Now, I've got a little example of this because I know it's a bit hard to follow sometimes. So here I've got a glucose transporter molecule. Might look like a dog ring to you, but trust me, it's actually a glucose transporter molecule. So the insulin arrives, stimulates the insulin receptor. That brings about these changes and that brings this glucose transporter molecule up. 
into the surface of the cell, into the cell membrane. So there's now a hole through the phospholipid bilayer of the cell membrane. The insulin can't get through the phospholipid bilayer because the insulin, the, sorry, the glucose can't get through the phospholipid bilayer because the glucose is water soluble. So the glucose might try to get through the phospholipid bilayer, but it can't. But because of the activity of, of the insulin, this has come up to the surface and it's now on the surface. And watch, way, no problem at all. The glucose molecules can go straight through the hole. And now instead of having glucose molecules in the blood and tissue fluid, you've now got the glucose molecules inside the cell. Everyone's happy. We're not hyperglycemic anymore. And the mitochondria have got, has got the glucose that it wants, that they want to produce energy. So it's quite a neat system, really. Now, what happens when blood glucose levels are too low? If you haven't eaten for a few days? Well, in this situation, well, actually, I get pretty hungry after about six hours, never mind a few days. But certainly after a few hours of not eating, say 12 hours of not eating, the blood sugar levels are going to be well down, and that's going to be detected by the alpha cells. It's the alpha cells that detect low levels of blood glucose, and they produce glucagon. They produce the hormone glucagon. And what that glucagon will do is the glucagon will act on the stored glycogen. Glucagon will act on stored glycogen. And what that glucagon will do to the stored glycogen is the glucagon will convert the stored glycogen back into soluble glucose molecules. So the blood sugar level drops. That's detected by the alpha cells. The alpha cells produce glucagon. The glucagon acts on stored glycogen in the muscles and the liver. And that glucagon converts the glycogen back into glucose. And because the glucose is soluble, it will dissolve into the blood and raise blood sugar levels back up again. So that means even if you don't eat for 24 hours or longer, your blood glucose levels can be maintained by glucagon converting glycogen back into glucose. That process is actually called gluconeolysis. Gluconeolysis. Neo means new, lysis means to break up. It breaks up the glycogen, converts it back to glucose. But after a couple of days, it depends how much you've been eating before, but after two or three days, certainly after something like four days, all of the stored glycogen in the body will be used up. That's why you lose weight quickly if you stop eating. You'll lose quite a lot of weight in the first few days because you use up your uh, glycogen and you lose weight, especially because glycogen is a sugar, it's osmotic and it sucks in water. So when you stop eating quickly, you'll lose glycogen and you'll lose a lot of water with it and you'll lose weight quickly. But unfortunately, you're not losing fat in that early stage, or not that much anyway. But, so after a few days, the glycogen reserves will be used up. Well, what are we going to do then? We can't die of starvation if we just don't eat for two or three, four days. Well, what actually happens is the glucagon will act on the liver, and it will cause the liver to produce glucose from other stored nutrients in the body such as fats and, to some extent, protein. So the glucagon will actually act on the liver to make the liver synthesise sugar from other stored food products. And that process is called gluconeogenesis. Gluco, glucose, neo, new, genesis, beginning. It's the beginning of new glucose. Gluconeogenesis. So what does glucagon do to maintain blood sugar levels? Well, first of all, it converts glycogen to glucose, the process. 
whereby you can maintain the blood sugar levels in the blood from the stored glycogen. But then when the glycogen runs out, it will stimulate the liver to produce glucose from fats and proteins in the process of gluconeogenesis. And it will keep on doing that for many tens of days, for a good few weeks. Life can be maintained even if the person doesn't eat. So when the blood sugar level goes up, it's detected by the beta cells. The beta cells produce insulin, that brings it down. That's good. If the blood sugar level is too low, that's detected by the alpha cells. The alpha cells produce glucagon and the glucagon brings it back up again. So insulin lowers blood glucose levels, glucagon raises blood sugar levels. That is the mechanism by which homeostatic levels of blood glucose can be maintained over long periods of time. We'll look at these diagrams in a minute, and then I want to use this physiology to explain in basic terms the two types of diabetes, that is type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus. So I'm just, just uh, going to test my own blood glucose levels with this machine. There's lots of these on the market these days, but I'm going to use this one. And I've already put the stick, or the chip rather, from this box of sticks, the test strips. I've put the chip from that into this so it's calibrated. And I'm going to turn the machine on by putting in my test stick, or my test strip. And hopefully in a minute it will ask me for a drop of blood and there it's asking me for some blood. Now I'm using one of these relatively atraumatic pricker devices, they're much better than the old lancets, and I'm just going to prick myself on the side of my finger. I'm not going to use the flat of my finger here because that's the touch sensitive part. I'm going to use the side and I've just washed my hands so it's all nice and clean. And there I've pricked myself and I see if I get some blood. Ooh, yep, yeah, there we go. So I've now got a drop of blood. And with this machine, you don't scoop it up, it just scoops it up itself with capillary action. And we can see that come up into the stick now. And that's it. So now we just wait and see what the machine says. And we see that my blood sugar at the moment is 6.2 millimoles of glucose per litre of blood. 